Brothers and sisters, Christ is in our midst. Joy to be gathered with you here. We're going to, I'm going to introduce our speakers and then we're going to open with a prayer. I'm going to say one prayer rope. I got to go find my prayer rope. And I'll give it back to you. I'll give it back to you. I gave him. I gave him the prayer room. But I have another. <laughs> and then Father's going to say a prayer room, and we're going to do that the be- this at the beginning of each of the sessions. But first, I want to introduce Father James and Korea Linda. Thank you for making the trip um, from Illinois or Indiana. I always get con- <laughs> Illinois. Father James has been a a mentor and a friend uh, for the 20 years of my priesthood, and I really am always looking looking to him. I was in seminary with two of his daughters, studying music and studying theology, and I first met them there. And uh, he's always been a cheerful, supportive, playful big brother. And I appreciate that as I've seen his life unfold, I saw a lot of grief happen. And he's gonna tell us about that. And he's he's processed it in a beautiful way. And sometimes these things happen to us and they, they ruin our lives, but they don't have to, it doesn't have to be that way. And that's why I invited uh, Father and Korea to share your story and how God can shape us through these very harsh, harsh uh, scalpels. Okay, so you can you can stay seated, and I'm going to say one prayer rope, and then Father's going to say one prayer rope. He's going to say a, a Jesus prayer for departed people individually that he has in mind. I'll just say the the normal Jesus prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. 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 Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on your departed servants. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on the servant of God, was he? Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on JC. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on the children. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. 
Hear me okay like this? Okay. Maybe we don't need it. <clears throat> well, thank you for having me here, my wife Linda, uh, Nicoletta. We, as we've told some of you, we've celebrated 48 years together, most of them good. Uh, the only, only aspect that has not been good is some of the grief we've suffered together. But we've been relatively at peace all that time. Uh, turn and look at the icon on the back wall. We call that the falling asleep or the dormition of the Theotokos. And with the resurrection of Christ, death got changed to dormition, to resting, to falling asleep. That is the definition of our dying as well. Okay, that's it. True, true. Uh, Lynn and I want to. I'm kind of a crybaby. I'm sorry about that, but that's just the way it is. Uh, Lynn and I want to share our hearts with you. This is not going to be a heavy theological. Uh, presentation, though we may venture into some theology along the way. I hope we do, actually. But um, we want to share our hearts with you about how we have uh, found our way through the valley of the shadow of death. We're all going to go through that valley, one way or the other. I used to tell... Uh, the OCF at the University of Illinois every year at the beginning of the year, we'd have a group of maybe 30, 40 kids in the room, and I would tell them, uh, someone in this room is going to suffer a major loss this year, and it always was true. Didn't want it to be, but it was always true. Someone in this room, I can say now with utter confidence, is going to suffer a major loss this year, if you haven't already. And I don't know what kind of griefs are out there in this crowd. Is anyone in this, um, just hold your hands up, has anyone here lost someone close to them in the last year? Look at that. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten at least. Uh, in the last four years. Oh, there. Uh, that's the reality of living in this fallen world. Uh, people we know and love. Uh, are getting older, like I am, and people we love uh, that are young uh, sometimes uh, fall asleep in Christ or maybe outside the bounds of the church and we don't know the outcome of their life eternally. But we want to talk to you about that and our journey through the various griefs we've experienced. Uh, so uh, you're free to ask questions anytime. In the course of the talk, if I, if I want to answer it later, I'll tell you that. Uh, if you'd rather have Linda talk, that's great, too. Uh, the earliest uh, death of someone in our family that I can remember, I was in kindergarten, and my mom came to school, and she took me out of class, and we went straight to the Greyhound bus station and took a bus to Arkansas. Her brother had drowned. One of her brothers had drowned. And about all I remember about that, other than being together with relatives, was my uh, an, another brother sitting next to him on the porch of, of uh, the uncle who's died's house while family and neighbors and what have you brought food and talked and what have you and shared memories. But anyway, this uncle said to someone else, he wasn't talking to me, uh, that he had been the one to find his brother in the river, the Arkansas River. He had been fishing and had some kind of accident. And it took about two or three days to find him in a brush pile. And when they pulled him out of the water, of course, from being in the water, he was all disfigured and swollen and what have you. And he said, uh, just to make sure it was him, he pulled out 
his driver's license and the picture of his driver's license that was disfigured by the water as well looked just like him. I, that's stuck in me as a little boy. And I only share that because uh, we want our children around to experience how we deal with grief and uh, funerals and what have you for our neighbors and our church members, our, our family, but we don't know what they're gonna remember. So be careful, be careful. And especially, you know, uh, if you're not prepared to deal with the grief uh, of the moment, uh, that's okay. That's part of it. And uh, but our children ought to be involved. And uh, I don't know if that's, that was in my mother's motivation or she just wasn't gonna be there to take care of me when I got out of school, so I had to take me with her, I don't know. Anyway, um, Probably the next loss that I experienced was the teammate of a swim teammate in uh, high school. I remember going to the funeral. Our swim coach said a few things because their whole team was there. Uh, and we went back to school or went home or whatever. Don't remember much about that other than high school kids want to do that. They want to go support their, uh, their classmate. And our children experienced some of that as they went through high school. Um, the next death, in, uh, <clears throat> I went to Indiana University for a couple of years and then I decided I wanted to make more of my spiritual life so I enrolled at Lincoln Christian College and University and my dad was not happy about that. He thought I was uh, abandoning the, the Methodist church I'd grown up in but he said okay and so I managed to find donors to help me with my uh, tuition, went off to school. And uh, in October, I got a call that he and mom were gonna come visit, and see the campus, he'd never been there. And I was excited about reconciling that difference and seeing what I was into. And uh, a couple of days before that planned visit, he had a major heart attack. He went in for open heart surgery, and this was early in the days of open heart surgery. They were still perfecting the, the uh, science of it and what have you. And he really never recovered. I, I think he probably got oxygen deprived. The doctor had warned us that he probably would have a little bit personality change. His was radical. And he was pretty much uh, homebound for the next year and a half, in and out of the hospital a little bit. My mom, devoted to him, uh, wouldn't leave his side. Uh, unless I was there to take her place. But then he, uh, he died in the middle of July in 1975, and Linda and I were married two weeks later. And my mother came and put on a good face, but she told Linda later it was the hardest day of her life. I was oblivious, caught up in the beauty of my wife and the joy of the day. <laughs> but for her, it was a very hard day. She had lost her husband, her partner of many years. He wasn't there to share it with her, and she was looking ahead at a long, lonely life. Uh, but she put on a good face. Eventually she moved to, uh, shortly after that we moved to Illinois, but I guess it's seven or eight years later, but uh, and she moved with us. Um, but that was the next major loss that I experienced, the loss of my dad. And because he had been sick for about a year and a half and his personality had changed, I think I had already kind of processed him being gone emotionally. Uh, so at the time of his funeral and stuff, I don't remember particularly being distraught the way my mom was anyway. And like I said, I was distracted with being married and what have you. Um, we moved to Illinois in 1983. A couple years later, we were there for uh, 
some kind of conference or something back in Indianapolis. And we got a call. Uh, Linda got a call that uh, they just found out her mother had cancer and she should come home. So we didn't even go home. We went from Indianapolis, drove to near St. Louis Wood River, where she's from, and found out that, uh, yes, she had brain cancer. It was inoperable. Lung cancer, I'm sorry, but it spread to her brain. And uh, you want to talk about that? Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Make her come on. <laughs> uh, anyway, we spent the, uh, the next six weeks. Uh, I went back home with the children. Linda stayed or came home and went back. I don't know. And uh, the next six weeks were her trying to figure out how she could help her mother uh, being Come and talk about being angry with your father. Okay. Yeah, they want to hear about my anger. <laughs> yeah, they do. Because that's part of it. Okay. Um, one of the things uh, during that time. Turn your mic on. Is this on? Okay. Uh, one of the things during that time that he didn't mention is that I was six weeks out from having our fourth child. And so the time I was spending with my mother, uh, which was about two and a half hours from where we lived, um, my other children were at home. My doctor said, go ahead and go. I'll, I'll let you know when you should come back. Um, so instead of being home, preparing for our fourth child and preparing my children for their new sibling, um, I was with my mother. And during that time, um, I had a difficult time with my father, who was not a Christian. Uh, we didn't have the best relationship anyway, I, probably similar to some of your experiences, but um, he developed this habit where he would only talk in whispers. And he would not talk about the end of her life. We weren't allowed to talk to her about dying because he didn't want her to give up, is what he said. And my thought at the time was, she has no choice, you know, that she is terminal. She's going to die and she's going to die soon. Um, so we had this struggle back and forth of how to take care of her. Uh, she was going through treatment, which was more to treat her pain than to for a cure. And I understood that, but I don't think my father accepted that. Um, uh, one example was uh, she had a lot of nausea. Uh, from her treatment, and the only thing that would help her was these suppositories that we were able to give her. And my father got angry with me because I would give her one of these suppositories, and he would say, that cost $2 a suppository. And he was just like, we just can't afford that. And forgive my language. <laughs> But I said to him, I don't care if we're shoving gold up her ass. She's getting it. Um, and it's one of the few times I really came at him. Um, but it, that was just, that's an example of this back and forth that we were going through. And my mother wanted to talk. Um, she, we did have a pastor come and talk with her, and I found that very unfulfilling, um, but uh, she wanted to talk, and one of the things we talked about during that time is when I was 16, my mother was pregnant, and um, there were four kids in our family, and um, she miscarried, um, and I think, I don't know for sure, I think she was about four months along when uh, this baby died. And I was with her at home when this happened. And I remembered some of the things that, like my grandmother and my aunt said to her, you know, well, you were too old to have a child anyway. Um, 
you, you know, you can't afford another one. Um, the, the, the baby's better off. Things like that. They, you know, that they meant to be comforting to her, but were not what someone who just lost their child wanted to hear. Um, so, at, during this time of dying, she talked about that child. She said, you know, and she always was pretty sure it was a boy. She said, he would have graduated from my school by now. He might be in college by now. We really could have afforded it. We managed. Um, so the different, all of that was inside her. All that time she'd been thinking about this baby that she never was able to, to hold. Um, so, you know, my dad didn't want to hear that kind of stuff, but fortunately he would leave, <laughs> and so mom and I would have time to actually talk. Um, and then another thing that happened was actually with my husband. He was happened to be there, and they were sitting outside, I believe, on the porch out there. Anyway, she turned to him and said, Jim, am I going to die? And, and you know, he had courage. He said, yes. And it, I think, and yeah, yes and soon. And I think that freed her up a lot then to be able to talk more with us um, and her, her other children and um, things that she expressed to me during that time and um, telling me how proud she was of me and um, of our family, uh, you know, just different things like that. It was a very good conversations for us. Um, and so one of the things I would say, and he's mentioned it briefly and we'll talk about it later, is including your children in those situations. Um, it, yes, it is hard, um, but so that they're able to ask those troubling questions at the time when you're going through a loss, um, instead of them, you know, keeping it to themselves and years later you find out the things that really troubled them. You ready to take back over? <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> okay. Um, so we buried her mother Two days later, she gave birth to our fourth child. For the next year, Linda didn't know whether to be happy or sad. Her emotions were all mixed up, and the rest of us had to live with that. <laughs> but we got through it. Uh, but you keep that in mind. If somebody's going through that kind of combination of things, they may be mixed up themselves and not know what to feel. So we went through that for a year, and then a friend of ours, a dear friend, uh, turn this thing back on, don't I? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, about, a, about a year after that, a friend of ours had a daughter uh, who had a heart defect die during heart surgery. By this time, we are on our way to becoming Orthodox. We're not Orthodox yet. The group of churches we were part of. Some of you were here last night, and I talked to you about the journey of the EOC into the Orthodox Church. We were part of that. Anyway, this, this other friend of ours was a pastor at another church and lost his daughter. And we had already started to have icons in our churches then, little ones. Not a big, glorious churches like this, but we had icons. And we were reading the lives of the saints. And one of the things I noticed at the funeral, because we still had connections in Christian churches and other churches around the area where he lived, is that the people coming to the visitation uh, seemed to be dealing with their grief differently than those of us who were beginning to be Orthodox. The communion of the saints had become more real to us we had their pictures up and around. And uh, I might be wrong, but it certainly looked like to me across the board 
that the, those of us who were becoming Orthodox had a little different take on what was happening to Mercy Angela, this, this little child that died. Again, I might be wrong, but that was my perspective. I certainly feel that way now, but uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, after that, about another year later, uh, I guess it was a couple years later, Linda's dad uh, was in a motorcycle accident, a very bad one. He had his then new girlfriend on the motorcycle with him, but had to uh, <clears throat> collapse his bike and ran into the side of a pickup truck that had cut across in front of him in the traffic. Uh, the woman that was with him uh, was hospitalized, but he suffered massive trauma. And they called us and said, try to get here before he dies. So we drove to St. Louis again in a hurry. When we got to the hospital, uh, as it worked out, I was the only one in the family that they let go in and probably should, was the only one that should go in and see Ed, her husband, or her dad's name was Ed. Uh, he had, well, they said he had so many fractures in his skull they couldn't count them all. And the only reason I could even recognize him was a ring he had on his hand still. They hadn't taken off. Uh, but the, the reason I bring this up is <clears throat> at the funeral, uh, Linda's dad had been part of a, uh, a motorcycle club, not a gang really, but a motorcycle club of older men that tried to act tough. <laughs> is that fair? <laughs> And so uh, her brother was, was kind of a part-time pastor, and he and another friend did the funeral for his dad. Uh, but the thing that was particularly upsetting is the motorcycle club had arranged this big parade in front of the uh, procession to the cemetery, and it was particularly upsetting to Linda, and I don't know about the other brothers and sister, but... Um, it was upsetting to her because of the whole lifestyle that recommended, that that represented to her and her estrangement from her father. So we rode off to the, to the grave with this big procession of motorcycles in front from all over the St. Louis area, I suppose. And uh, one of the net results of all that was her brother uh, rebuilt her father's motorcycle and became kind of a quasi-chaplain to the motorcyclists around the St. Louis area. And he'd get called upon to do weddings and funerals and what have you for them. Uh, is that enough about that? Yeah, okay. Um, then after that, the next significant thing for me was uh, as we were on our journey into the Orthodox Church, weren't quite Orthodox yet, uh, I enrolled in a residency as a clinical pastoral education chaplain at a local hospital. They had a program that had uh, one unit sessions for people that couldn't be free all the time, but I took a full year residency. I worked there full time for a year. And during that year, I went back and looked at my, my notes afterwards. I dealt with on an average five deaths a week. About three or four weeks into it, I was sitting in our living room on the couch and my oldest daughter came in and I said, Rachel, come here. She sat down next to me and I hugged her and I hugged her. Then I said to her, I just needed to hold on to someone who was alive. After that, I was fine because I was dealing with my own mortality. Seeing this death all the time was driving home to me that I was dying too. But then after that, the, the ministry I enjoyed the most at the, in the rest of that year was dealing with people who were facing terminal illness, oncology, uh, ICU, heart patients, that kind of thing. When I had to do uh, orthopedics, that was miserable because those people just wanted to get out of the hospital and go home, you know, feel better. But but the other part of it was very, uh, people that, know that knew that they were uh, facing the end of life and wanted to deal with those kind of issues. 
A hospital chaplain isn't a pastor per se. His main job is to connect you to your own spiritual resources, whatever they might be, but lots of people don't have any. So the hospital chaplain kind of becomes their de facto pastor. And I think I, I reveled in that work. It was so good for me. That year was so, I'm all right. That year was so good for me that uh, after I finished, Linda applied and she did a full year uh, in the same kind of program. She had different interests that I did. But in the year that I did this uh, CPE, I had a chance to study thanatology, the study of death, quite a bit, and was fascinated by some of the things I learned. I mentioned to Father yesterday, um, one of the things I learned is what, in a major loss, like the loss of a child, a spouse, uh, it might take as much as 500 hours of talking to resolve that in your soul. Now that sounds like an enormous amount, and it is. But uh, if you have a community around you that are willing to listen and talk, uh, and listen to your story over and over again, uh, you can do that. It might take five years. Uh, but that's a, that's a component of grieving that most people aren't aware of, how much time it takes to really resolve and be ready to go on with life. You don't forget, but you have to process that. So one thing we want to encourage you about, and we'll talk about this more later, is that if you're experiencing a major loss in your life, you find people to talk to and uh, find people that will listen to you tell your story over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, just doing this is helpful for us. Uh, we've done several of these retreats now. I've done a few by myself, and Linda's had a chance to go with me several times, and she's done a lot of work on her own. And it's helped us resolve our grief, you know, so that we can stand kind of talk to you about it. So anyway, we both did a, a, year, a full year of uh, clinical pastoral education, which uh, the program is designed to make you look at yourself and see what's going on inside of you and recognize your own stuff so that you don't project that onto other people in the, in the course of your ministry. But also to discover ways to help people in their, in their grief. Anyway, so that was the next thing for me. Uh, one morning in uh, 1999, January 2nd, well, on, on New Year's Day, our whole family had been over to my mother's house. She had moved to in Illinois with us and uh, had a great day. And the next morning, I was going back to my secular job. I worked for many years in the building business, different aspects of the building business as a carpenter and a salesman and what have you. Uh, but I would go over to my mother's house in the morning and she would make a pot of coffee. A pot of coffee. <laughs> That's where I got it. She would make a pot of coffee and uh, I would lay out all my paperwork for the day and kind of get my day organized, spend a little time with her every day, and then I'd be off to work. Well, January 2nd, I went over and she'd always have the door unlocked. so. I just opened the door and come in. And she was sitting in her recliner with her back to the door, which was unusual. Usually she was at the kitchen table. And I walked over and said, good morning, mom. And there was no answer. She had gotten up, made the coffee, unlocked the door, gone and sat down in her chair and died. I must have missed her by 10 or 15 minutes. So I went through the, you know, I called the, probably called the, the uh, local undertaker, probably her funeral director. I probably called him first, maybe the fire department, I don't know. But a couple of friends that we knew in town came over and there was no need for an autopsy or anything like that. It was in, like I say, January. And of course, if you think about the church calendar, that's right before theophany. So, we had theophany services at our church. The News Gazette, the local newspaper, came and did a photo array about the service. And one of the captions for the photo 
that the local paper wrote was, Father James washes the cross for the Feast of Epiphany. Silly, you know, they didn't listen to what I told them. So at the visitation for my mother, which was happening the evening of the 6th, January 6th, I think, or maybe the 7th, I don't know, remember exactly. But uh, the Greek priest in town, who was a friend, and his family came, and he walked up, and I hadn't seen the paper, okay? And he walks up to me and he says, Father James, you Antiochians have the cleanest crosses. <laughs> I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. <laughs> And then he explained about the picture in the paper and what have you. Anyway, uh, my mom had not been in that town very long. We were her, really her only close friends. There were a couple of others, but a few people and all the people in our church came to the visitation. And then we were doing the uh, funeral such as it was. She wasn't Orthodox, so the Tersagi and what have you, we were going to do that in Indianapolis at the funeral home uh, at the burial site, their chapel there. It was the coldest day of the year, 20 below zero. The, the, only the bravest people of our friends in Indianapolis could come down to where this funeral chapel was. Uh, Father Joseph, uh, uh, he came, and his deacon, who's now a priest, and a few other families, but not many people. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't open the grave and barrier. We couldn't be there, there for that because it was just too cold. Uh, so that was the burial of my mother next to my father in Indianapolis. And later on, my aunt would be buried there with them. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, a deacon uh, in the church in Hobart uh, died the next year. Uh, I was a newly ordained deacon at that point. I was only a deacon for about a year, but this fell in that window of time. Linda and I are about halfway to Gary, Indiana, and I said, oh no, I left my vestments at home. So I said, we don't have time to go back. So we went on. I went meekly up to the bishop, Bishop Dimitri, and said, uh, say, no, forgive me, I, I don't have my vestments. And he says, James, Deacon James, we don't go to war without our weapons. Don't let this ever happen again. Then he looked over at somebody else, the priest, I think the local priest, and said, uh, can he borrow fathers, can he borrow deacon's vestments for the funeral? And so I had vestments. This deacon's uh, funeral, uh, he had been a, a volunteer fire department medic and it died uh, as a result of injuries. Uh, his ambulance got run off the road, hit a tree. He was paralyzed for about a year, uh, able to live at home, come to church a few times, uh, but only lived about a year after the injuries, year and a half maybe. Much loved, but the, uh, the funeral was the most uh, elaborate thing I've ever seen. After the church visitation, they did a visitation at the high school in that town, which was packed, and the local priest and the bishop both got to speak, which was amazing. Then they went to the cemetery. Uh, he went to the cemetery on the back of a fire truck, flags up in the air. They had hook and ladder trucks at the, at the funeral, I mean at the cemetery, flags waving and what have you. It was quite... Quite a wonderful tribute to this man. People all along the... Yeah. Down the streets of this town. It was lined with people. Uh, just, I mean, signs on the stores and the restaurants. You know, blessed memory, Deacon Frank or Firefighter Frank or whatever it was. It was really a, quite a tribute. Anyway, uh, so that was Deacon. It's Deacon's death. Then, uh, in October of 2005, how are we doing for time, Father? Okay, no problem. We threw away the one. Okay. In October of 2005, we went to the same church, actually, 
for the baptism of one of our granddaughters. And uh, it was wonderful. Baptism of our granddaughter, Sophia, who's just graduating high school now. Anyway, uh, Sunday afternoon, we pack up the car. It's Linda and I, my oldest daughter and her husband, and our youngest daughter. Uh, everybody else was scattered about or whatever, but we're driving home Sunday afternoon. I'm driving, and I say, Linda, at the next exit, I'm going to get off and let you drive. I'm getting sleepy. Before we got there, I did fall asleep. The car uh, went off the road to the left. My daughter behind me yelled, Dad, Dad. I woke up enough to steer back, and then the car started tumbling. Our car tumbled 10 times on the interstate, sideways, and then went off into the ditch on the side. My wife can tell her story about her guardian angel telling her to get her arm back in the car and how to twist and turn so she wouldn't be. Well, don't you tell her. OK, we'll go. <laughs> You can go ahead. Okay, she'll tell that in a minute. Uh, I was knocked unconscious almost immediately. Uh, I don't think the airbags ever went off, but I, my seatbelt put a big bruise across my chest. Uh, all of us ended up in the hospital. Uh, when we got there in two or three ambulances, I'm not sure how many, uh, and, and by the way, the car ended up upside down and backwards or something. I, don't, I still don't have in my head how it ended up, but I'm sure it was upside down. And uh, they got us out of the car. Uh, and like I said, I was knocked out. I didn't know kind of what was going on with the, everybody else. Linda thought I had abandoned her when they took me out of the car on the left side. Or, anyway... Uh, when we got to the hospital, uh, they had separated my oldest daughter from us because she had a different last name, okay? And we heard her cry down the hallway. Then the coroner came in and told us that Nathan had died in the accident. Linda says she already knew. Noetically, I suppose. Yes. And... Uh, Anyway, uh, they, uh, uh, because of this big knot on my head, they had pushed our daughter, our youngest daughter, in between the two of us to tell us this. And immediately they took me off for a CAT scan because of this bump on my head. It was about the size of a tennis ball right here. And when I got done with that, they pushed me into a different room and I heard a woman crying behind a curtain. And then a doctor or a nurse, somebody asked me a question so that, that, so that she heard my voice. And it was my uh, daughter. And she said, Dad, is that you? I was afraid because I had caused the death of her husband by my falling asleep. And I didn't know what to expect from her at that point. But I said, yes, honey, it's me. And she said, Christ has risen. That's the most wonderful thing she could have said to me. Christ has risen. I knew it instantly that she had found her faith, that she knew the outcome of Nathan's life, that she and I would be okay. So every Pascha, the first time I say that, that's in my mind, in my heart. Uh, the outcome of Nathan's life and uh, her faith in that. Uh, now you tell about it. Okay. You pardon me, Jackson. I'll try. Along with that, um, I learned later that anybody who came into Rachel's room, she would say, Christ is risen. And uh, to the nurses, to 
custodians, whoever, she would say, Christ is risen. And um, she told me later, they probably thought I was nuts, you know. <laughs> but that was what she was clinging to, that Christ was risen. Um, so I'll go back and tell you a little bit about what um, happened with me during that accident. Um, I don't know, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, but growing up and as an adult, there would be times when I would think, what will I do in an emergency? Will I know what to do? Um, and I found out that day that I, I did know what to do. Um, as soon as we, you know, had veered off into the uh, ditch, is what I'll call it, uh, it, what came to mind was you need to pray. Now, I won't say this was just, you know, a warm, glorious prayer. I was frantic, <laughs> and I was crying out, Lord, send your angels to help us. And I just kept saying that over and over and over. And then the, the car went back up on the road, and we started to roll. And my initial response was to close my eyes. You know, I, I just wanted to not see it. And I believe it was my angel said, no, keep your eyes open. You need to know what to do. And so um, at one point during, I mean, it seemed like it took forever for us to roll, and it really wasn't that long, but, you know, so we're rolling, and um, I remember saying something about Mary. Where's Mary? That's our youngest daughter. And the angel told me, she's fine. She's out of the car. She's fine. And then um, finally the car stopped rolling, but we slid for what seemed like forever to me. But it was during that time the car had rolled over, we were on, uh, sort of on a, on top of the, you know, the car was, we were upside down, but it was leaning on my side of the car, on the passenger side. And my arm, I, we were sliding on this, on the ground, and my arm was, you know, hitting the ground, I could feel the grass, and I was told, you've got to We've got to get your arm up. And of course, with the force and everything, it was, it was very hard to get a hold of my arm, but I felt someone helping me, and I was able to pull my hand up. Um, I, I think my arm would have come off if I hadn't been able to get it up. Um, so then we finally stopped, and... Um, I was kind of hanging from uh, the seat belt, and people were coming to try to help us. Um, and I started, Rachel and Mary and my husband were all out of the car by then, but I knew Nathan was behind me. And um, I was saying, what about Nathan? What about Nathan? And um, I was told, he's with me, he's with me. So I knew that he had passed. Um, and then there were two men that came and were trying to get us out of the car. And one was uh, someone who, in my mind, looked like my brother-in-law, Bill. and. I just knew to trust him because my brother-in-law was a very capable person and he uh, worked for 911. He'd been a volunteer uh, fire or a policeman, but I just knew to listen to him. And then a younger man was with him who looked like Bill's son, my nephew, uh, another Bill. Um, and the older man was telling him what to do. Um, but to me, um, I'm 
fairly confident that there were, those were two angels that God had sent and took on a form that I would trust and listen to. Um, and then they eventually were able, they had to get Nathan out because he was on top of me, and then they had to get me out. Um, but I remember um, getting to the hospital. Finally, I was in so much pain. And um, <clears throat> a uh, Roman Catholic priest who was the chaplain at that, that hospital came to tell me that Nathan was dead. And honestly, having been a chaplain myself and uh, the experience that we had um, being chaplains, I really wanted this man to leave the room. Uh, he came, he's, you could tell he was, and I, I hope I don't offend anybody, but he was a smoker. He smelled horrible. And he had been drinking. And all I could think was, you know, oh, Lord. <laughs> you know, I, I just, it was, it was just an awful time. I couldn't wait for him to leave. Um, and it was a... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Then I went. I was transferred to another hospital, and um, one of the other things that was so frustrating is this was a trauma center we were in, but it wasn't a level one trauma center. It was like nine or ten, um, and we had worked at a hospital that had a level one trauma center, and we we knew <laughs> what that care was supposed to be like. And it was not like that. And I, you know, I just, we couldn't get answers out of them. It was just, you know, they separated us. They didn't give us time to be together. Um, but then I got transferred to another hospital, a Catholic hospital, and um, in Lafayette. And he wasn't able to, no one was with me. My, and my sister was driving up from St. Louis to be with me. And our uh, daughter, Susanna, was able to come over, but she had been at the hospital with them, and then she and her husband left and came to Lafayette, to the hospital where I was. Anyway, so I was in this Catholic hospital, and there was not a cross to be seen <laughs> in my room. And I was desperately trying to, to pray and you know, try to focus myself uh, in my faith, but I was just so traumatized, and the only thing I could think was, I need a cross and something to just look at. Um, and I asked the nurse, is, is there a cross in here I can't see? And she looked around and she said, no, there's, there's not any in here. And I said, oh, okay. Um, anyway, um, I finally as best I could, I turned on the TV, and it was the middle of the night. But I found the Catholic uh, channel, and there was a nun praying, and that's what started, you know, I was just like, okay. And that kind of helped me get focused again. But then um, my daughter was able to get there, and um, I remember her saying, I can't do this, Mom. I don't, I don't know what to do. And I said, you know, you have to. You're the only one you have to right now. Um, but she and her husband found, or went by the gift shop and found a small wooden cross and brought it back up to me. So I think that's about it with the accident. So. Okay, oh. easy. The guys last night will tell you that. Easy 15 minutes. Uh, some more about the accident. Linda's uh, clavicle, collarbone was broken. Uh, she had a vertebrae or two in her neck that were one that was broken. All the ribs on one side of her chest were broken. At the first hospital, they didn't recognize that. At the second hospital, they didn't recognize that all her ribs were broken. When we got her back home, one of a doctor we knew said, how could they not see this? He showed me the x-ray. It looked like a bunch of spikes sticking up all down that side of her chest. They kept trying to put this brace around her for her collarbone, which they eventually said, we don't need to treat that. 
but they were kept crushing her chest with, the, with that. Linda was in the, a hospital bed in our home for three months. Uh, her injuries were so bad. She wasn't able to attend the funeral for Nathan. Uh, we used a nearby Greek church for the visitation and funeral. Then we transported him to Cincinnati, where he's from, so his parents could have him near them. Uh, people were so supportive of us. Uh, the priest in Lafayette, Indiana, the Carpatho Russian priest there, who's a longtime friend, had me at their house when I was able to go there and be with Linda. Some friends at home had built a wheelchair ramp for, so we could get her in the house when we got home. Uh, meanwhile, our daughter, Risa, who was serving as a youth director in Houston at the time, uh, came up and uh, she actually drove, did she drive you? Or did she drive me? I don't know what you're talking about. At the hospital, she came and got us. She got somebody. I think she came and got you because... No, Melody came and got Melody, me. okay. Anyway, she was there. Uh, maybe she met uh, Gary Allen taking me to meet her. I don't know. Anyway, people were very supportive. They gave us what we needed. Our daughter, Risa, uh, t prematurely resigned her position in Houston and moved up, really, to take care of our youngest daughter, who had a uh, broken foot and a, a damaged knee, so she couldn't walk on either leg. She was in a wheelchair in her house, and uh, she was quite, Risa was quite entertaining all, through all that. Uh, and of course, Rachel had lost her husband, our oldest, and uh, uh, we spent the next several months with her in a bed and uh, just trying to get through it. I went back to work at my secular job, and something had changed for me. I was a uh, building material salesman. I would go out to job sites and uh, uh, tell the contractor what he needed. I knew more about the process than he did and take orders for what they needed and I would get it there on time and what have you. That was my job. Uh, and I could, before that, before the accident, I could hold it all in my head. I could go look at the job. I knew what was needed. I knew what the address was, even though the addresses weren't up yet on the street. I could do all that. After the accident, I didn't care. I didn't care about that much, very much anymore. I still needed the job. So I had to change the way I did things. I went and got a computer that I could draw on the screen and make notes as I walked around so I would always have it with me. I could put a map of the subdivision on there so I could get the addresses. Uh, I just found it hard to concentrate on that part of my life because I had touched on death and eternity. And that other stuff didn't matter as much anymore. I still had to do that work, and I did it for several years after that, but uh, something changed that day. Oh, uh, let's see. What else can I tell you about all that? As I said, Linda wasn't able to attend the funeral. It still hurts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, about a year after that, a good friend, Father Anthony Bell, I've got his picture up here, uh, had had cancer that developed in his jaw and eventually ate away about half of his face as they excised and did surgery and what have you. We did a, uh, all the presbyters in our area joined at his church to do a unction service maybe six months before he finally died. I visited him several times along the way. Uh, very faithful man. His funeral was the first time that I had vested a priest for a funeral. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you about that process. When Father Noah or I die, it'll be me first. When we die, all the priests in the area and the bishop hopefully will come to wherever our body is and prepare it for its burial. They'll wash it with oil, and then they'll put our vestments on, our clothes first, our pants and shirt, what have you. And then they'll put our vestments on, just like we're gonna serve the liturgy. 
and there are the deacons will be there reading the prayers for vesting as we're doing as we're putting the vestments on. And it's kind of tricky to put vestments on. Excuse me, a stiff. <laughs> Uh, depending on how long it's been since the, the person died, their body can be very rigid. So anyway, we vest the, vest the priest for his funeral, and then uh, he, we put him in his coffin or a casket and uh, finish the tr Trisagion prayers. Then we transport him to the church. We sing the Trisagion as we bring him in, and he sits right here, as all of you will for your funerals, and I'm sure many of you have witnessed Orthodox funerals. It's his last liturgy. It's his last service. And he gets to be the, in the center, so to speak, for that last funeral. Uh, typically, there'll be a candle put at the head of the coffin. Uh, it's appropriate when you come in the church to go up and kiss his hand or his forehead. Uh, maybe you'll have a blessing cross in his hand. You can kiss that. Uh, Anyway, Father Anthony's funeral was the first time I'd done that, participated in that process. Uh, several priests that you would probably know were there. Father Peter Gilchrist was there because he lived, he was in the area for whatever reason. He had been instrumental in Father Anthony coming to the Orthodox faith. Anyway, um, that was my first experience doing that. And it was the holiest thing next to celebrating the Eucharist I've ever done prepare his body as one of my brothers to go to his grave to wash his body to say the prayers as we put on his vestments was a life changing thing and I won't miss one of those if I have the opportunity to be there and I've done several since then now I know that your community has a burial society and I would encourage you to participate in that and enjoy the holiness of preparing a brother or sister for their burial. It's a holy thing. It's not morbid. It is about death, but it's not gross. If it's not for you, okay, I get that. But my experience is it's a holy thing. It's transformative. Uh, you know that in monasteries, a lot of times, they'll have uh, ossuaries where they, they store the bones of their departed brothers uh, or sisters. You've probably seen photos of piles and piles of skulls and that kind of thing. And the monks kind of joke. They say, we're going to be, you know, they'll go and pray there and they'll say, I'm going to uh, visit with my, my future roommates. And that's how they condition themselves to not be afraid of death and to remember it, that it's coming for all of us. Okay, Father, let's stop there. Okay? That's an easy 15 minutes probably. You're going to say I got more time? We have about eight more minutes. Eight more minutes? Oh my. We can take a break. We can break a little early. Okay. Lisa later? Hmm? Are you going to talk about Risa later? Yeah, we'll tell you about Risa later. Okay. We'll start the next session with that. So we're ending seven minutes early and we're going to start seven minutes early or so.